Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me. Box 13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, we continue our series of radio adaptations of movies based on radio programs with the Screen Guild Theater presentation of So This Is Washington. This stars Chester Locke and Norris Goff, a.k.a. Laman Abner, who had been major players on radio since 1931 and would be on the air until 1954. This was an adaptation of the fourth Laman Abner film. They were one of the more successful series to jump from radio to film, particularly in the comedy arena. They would release a total of six or seven films, depending on how you count it. The film was originally released in 1943. The original air date for this Screen Guild Theater adaptation of So This Is Washington was March 12th, 1945. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Lady Esther Screen Guild play tonight, So This Is Washington. The starring players, This Is Lum. And this is Abner. This is Jimmy Grayson. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in another delightful yarn about two lovable old codgers you all know. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players present Lum and Abner and Jimmy Gleason in RKO Pictures, So This is Washington. It's late evening in Pine Ridge. Well, it's about 8.30, and in Pine Ridge, that's late. The town is blanketed in darkness now, all except the feed room of the Jotham Down store, where Abner Peabody is busily working with a number three junior Misto chemistry set. His partner, Lum Edwards, attracted by the light, stands in the doorway. And they hold it sakes, Abner, what are you doing here this time of the night? Huh? Oh, well, howdy, Lum. <laughs> what are you cooking there? Smells terrible. Oh, it's just some chemicals, Lom. See, I've decided to become a great chemist. Chemist? I thought I told you to quit monkeying around with that junk. Well, I'm just now getting good at it, Lom. See, I, I'm inventing a, a lot of stuff here that we can sell in the Jot 'em Down store. Mm. If it smells as bad as that junk, nobody could get close enough to it to buy any of it. <laughs> well, it ain't all like that. See, I, I've had good luck with my new Beauty Fine Mud Pack. Mud Pack? Yeah, you, you know what, Lom? I slapped a pack on my woman Elizabeth's face a couple of days ago. You know, it's supposed to make her skin nice and smooth. Yeah, well, did it help her any? <laughs> well, I don't know, Lum. She looks so much better with the pack on, I just hate to take it off. <laughs> well, I, I don't believe we'll ever sell many of them things. What else have you invented? Well, I was uh, working on some uh, invisible ink, but then I give that up, sort of. Well, give it up? What for? That sounds a little more sensible. Well, see, long as it's in a visible arm, I never could tell when I was done making it. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's right. I never thought about that. Be a big waste, too. When you're filling the bottles with it, you couldn't tell when they're full, and you spill a lot of it. Why, sure. <laughs> I might drown in this stuff and never even know it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad you give that up. Yeah, yeah. But what's that awful stuff you're boiling on the stove there in the stew kettle? Oh, that's just, uh, say, that, that reminds me, uh, Lom. 
Well, will you pick up that kettle for me there? Well, I'd be glad to get that junk off the stove. Uh, here, you better use them towels, Mom. That's hot. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And that smells awful. What do you want me to do with it? Uh, just shake it. That's it. Shake it a little harder now. I ain't doing it. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, that's a relief. Huh. What do you mean? Really? Uh, I'd have feared it might explode. That's dynamite. Dynamite? Yeah, uh, uh... Abner, take that stuff and throw it out of here before it blows us all to pieces. Throw it out? I wouldn't touch that kettle for $10,000. <laughs> Abner, you've just got to give up this silly chemistry junk. It's too dangerous. Why, uh... No, just wait a minute. What's the matter with me? That weren't my dynamite. <laughs> I wondered why it never blowed you up. <laughs> thought, you, thought you was a failure, huh? Oh, I was awful disappointed. <laughs> That's my new licorice candy. Licorice candy? Yeah, I never can tell them two apart. Well, that dynamite is a little bit sweeter, I believe. Now, there's something you can't complain about, Lom. I've been selling that licorice for two or three days now. Wait a minute. Is that the licorice we've got up there in the candy case? Why, sure. Well, that stuff's no good. Well, folks have been buying it, ain't they? Yeah, but not to eat. Huh? Cedric's been using it to patch his automobile tires with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grandpappy Spears made himself some sleeve garters out of yeah, it. Yeah, they're good ones, too. The young'uns has been using them for slingshots. Yeah, one of them young'uns shot Miss Johnson right between the back porch and the smokehouse, sir. <laughs> Granny, wait a minute. Did you actually make that stuff, Abner? Yeah, see, I just took some sweet gum and then Well, I... don't tell me. Don't tell that to nobody. Huh. From now on, that formula is a military secret. Huh? You get right home and pack your valise. My valise? Me and you are going to take that stuff right direct to Washington. To Mr. Marshall. Marshall? Who's he? He's head of the Civilian Aid in the War Effort, Incorporated. He is? Yes, sir. That's one of the things he's looking for. Oh, now, Mom. No feller in Washington's got time to sit around there chewing on licorice candy. This ain't licorice. It ain't licorice, I tell you. Huh? No, you've made something else here. Ah, uh, hell? Well, good for me. Hooray, hooray. <laughs> I know I do it. I know. What is it? You, <laughs> you've invented synthetics rubber. Welcome to Washington, gentlemen, and welcome to our hotel. And, uh, can I do anything for you? Well, uh, all we want's a room. Why, certainly. I can give you a nice, large, beautiful room the day after the war is over. Good. We'll just sit in these chairs and wait. Those, those chairs? Do you have a reservation? No, uh, nothing fancy, mister. All we want's a room. Well, now, I might just possibly have something. Uh, step right over here to the elevator, please. Yeah, we don't need too big a room. Just a couple of beds. Uh, just a moment, please. <sighs> oh. oh, sorry to disturb you, Senator. Uh, too bad, gentlemen. The elevator's taken. Uh, look here, mister. All we want is just a room. Just a moment, gentlemen. I was just phoning upstairs to see about one. A fellow died in 712. Good. I mean... Uh... Hello? Room 712? Is that room available now? Oh, I see. Y you mean we got here in time? You're just ten seconds too late. The undertaker beat you to it. Mom, I just can't walk no further. I'm all stove up from sleeping on that bad gum park bench. Well, just hold out for a couple of more steps. Mr. Marshall's office is on this floor. Oh, it's hard to death. Yeah, we'll run in and see him, and then we can go back to Pine Ridge and get some sleep. Hurry up. I'm coming, I'm coming. Here, eat, you want another banana? Oh, for pity's sakes, Abner, stop eating them bananas. Body would think you's from the country. Well, we've got to eat something. We ain't been able to get no lunchroom around here. Wait a minute. Here's his office. Now, let me do all the talking. Look, miss, I've got to see Mr. Marshall. I've been in Washington two weeks now. I've got a great invention here. And, and I've got a wife, and I've got to get back gentlemen, home. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Mr. Marshall will see you all, but you'll have to wait your turn. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, but I'm Lum Edwards, and this here's Abner Peabody, and we've got I'll to I'll take your names. You'll have to wait like the others. Oh. My invention can't wait. Look. You just pull this other string, and the parachute stops and shoots back up in the air. I know. You've explained that a hundred times. Uh, mine really is urgent, miss. The army needs it. Elephant tablets. Elephant tablets? You mean it makes a soldier big as an elephant? Oh, no. No, it gives him the memory of an elephant. Never oh. forgets a thing. Harmless, too. I take them myself. 
Pennies, don't they have no peculiar effect on you? Oh, none at all, none at all. Say, anybody got any peanuts? <laughs> I never heard so many wild ideas in my life. We might as well be listening to the Senate. Yeah, well, come on, let's go. I'll say anything for a laugh. Oh, me, Lum, I'm just plumb wore out. Don't look like we're ever going to see Mr. Marshall or find a place to sleep, neither one. I I'll bet the only vacant room in town is Eleanor's. No. We're lucky to find an empty park bench again, though. And you know, I wouldn't have missed this trip for nothing, Abner. Ever citizen or to see the Capitol here, you know it? Want a banana? No. Take that Lincoln Memorial statue. Now, there's the inspiringest one thing i ever seen in my life. That the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Did he get that from Charles Lawton? <laughs> and over there, something else inspiring. Washington's Monument. Where? Right over yonder. Just look at that. Huh. Oh, good. I never knowed he looked that away. No wonder he had to wear a three-cornered hat with a pointed head like that. Well, that ain't a statue of him. That's a monument to him. He could have cut down that cherry tree with his shoulder blades. And I'm trying to tell you that ain't no statue. Why, dog Islam, I know why it don't look like him. They got it upside down. All right, all right. Let you, it go. You know what they done? They sharpened that thing and then drove the wrong end in the ground. Sure to work. Just forget all about it. You know, Abner, I sure did enjoyed watching the Senate at work today. They said some awfully important stuff there while we was there. Uh, exactly what did they say, Lum? I, I never did figure out what they was talking about. Oh, oh, couldn't you follow that? I believe I jumped the track there somewhere. They, they was a pint in an investigating committee. Well, what's a committee supposed to investigate? They're supposed to investigate the investigating committee they, they appointed the day before. Well, what was the first committee supposed to investigate? Well, that's what the second committee's supposed to find out. Oh. Uh, I think there's room on this bench here, Senator. Ah, yes, Congressman. You don't mind, gentlemen. No, oh, no, no. Go ahead. Sit down, sit down. Have a banana, Senator. Abner. <coughs> no, no, thank you. I never know. Congressman, as I was saying, I want to do something about the situation in our state. But I'm helpless. You say the soil is completely arid. What wasn't blown away in 38 is now parched by last year's drought. And still, my bill for reclamation gets nowhere. I'm at my wit's end. I sympathize with you, Senator. I know exactly how you feel. They tell me if I could find a cheap way of having it done... I know a cheap way. Worms will do it. I beg your pardon. Were you talking to me? Yeah, I said if you had worms. If I had... Oh, he, he, he don't mean you personal. He means a saw. See, worms makes the ground just fine for growing things in. You mean earthworms. Why, well, sure. There's a special kind you can get. Now, we had a drought one year in Pine Ridge, and them worms practical saved our lives. <laughs> Recollect that. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, Al Potter still raised them out there on his place. And they ain't expensive, neither. Al will sell you a bucket full for a quarter. Yes, but, gentlemen, I have an entire state to cover. Well, you'll need more than one bucket, then. <laughs> I... I'm afraid it would run into too much money. No, it wouldn't. Uh, they're fast breeding, them worms there. Oh, yeah. You get a mom and papa worm, and before you can say Robinson Crusoe, uh, uh, you got... Right, that, uh, no need to go into detail. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is splendid, splendid. Hi, George, wait a minute. Maybe you men can help me with my problem, too. Now, my state... <laughs> Washington reporter with another interesting lead story for today. In the past week, two startling new personalities have made a terrific impression on this town. Two kindly old gentlemen from an unknown hill town in Arkansas have become a sort of dual oracle, consulted by some of the capital's best minds. Ministers without portfolio, they sit on a park bench, eat bananas, and dispense their advice to all who seek it. And believe me, a lot of that advice makes sense. As this reporter predicted, Mr. Marshall's civilian aid in the war effort incorporated continues to be a complete dud. Rather than uncovering any war-shortening inventions, Marshall has succeeded only in turning his office into a rendezvous for a gang of lunatics who... There he goes, taking another crack at me. Miss Jones, I'm going to sue that man for libel. On what grounds, Mr. Marshall? You know our outer office is jammed with people who are a little... I alive. know, I know. I'd hoped to make this a clearinghouse for good, sound, scientific ideas, but so far... 
Oh, frankly, I don't know where to turn now. Well, there's those two park bench sages, Lum Edwards and Abner Peabody. What? A man like me to go to men like them? Miss Jones, when I go and ask their advice, you can rest assured it'll be a long day. Uh, sorry, sorry, folks. That's all for today. I'll see you tomorrow morning. But, gentlemen, I'm next in line. <laughs> I'm sorry, mister. This is our short day. Yeah, we always knock off early on Wednesday. You see, we got to have some time to tend to what we come to Washington for in the first place. Come on, Abner. But, but, but gentlemen, this will only take a moment. Sorry, sorry. We, we've got to get over to that funny-looking building over there to see a certain feller. The Octagon Building? I'm going there, too. We can talk as we walk. Well, we'd rather you wouldn't follow us, because what we want to see this feller is about is sort of a military secret. By the way, Abner, have you still got the synthetics R-U-B-E-R with you? Yeah, yeah, right here in this B-O-K-S box. No, 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 uh, gentlemen, if you just let me state my problem. <laughs> Not now. No, that, that Marshal's a hard man to catch, and we don't want to miss him today. Marshal? Did you say Marshal? P-W. Why, that's me. I'm P.W. Marshall. Huh? Huh? Hi, Grannies, wait a minute. Put her there, Mr. Marshall. We got to get into the huddle. You mean you're going to listen to me? Well, not exactly. You're going to listen to us. As the curtain falls on Act One of the Lady Esther Screen Guild Players, the spotlight turns to you. Do you shrink from the glare of bright lights? Do you lose confidence when eyes are close? For new assurance you've never known before, listen to this message from Lady Esther. Often it's just some one little thing about your appearance that makes the difference between lack of confidence in yourself and complete poise and assurance. For example... You may have a dry, rough skin on which face powder looks all ruffled up and flaky. Well, that can disturb your entire personality and just when you want to be at your best. So here's what I'd like you to do before powdering. It will make a wonderful change in your appearance, and it will give you a marvelous new feeling of confidence in yourself. Just rub a little Lady Esther face cream on your skin, and then wipe it off, gently but completely. You see, Lady Esther face cream loosens the dry, clinging particles of skin nature is trying to throw off. And when you wipe off the cream, along with it come all those rough little flakes, leaving only the new young skin, which is smooth as velvet. And on this new skin, your powder takes on a fresh, vibrant look, a clear, translucent look. Now, if you want proof of all this, make the Lady Esther patch test. Just rub a little Lady Esther face cream on one patch of skin like one cheek. Wipe it off, and apply your powder. Then compare that side of the face with the other. Feel the difference with your fingers, and see the difference in your mirror. The patch test takes only 30 seconds, half a minute, but it tells more in that half a minute than I could say in an hour. You can still make the Lady Esther patch test tonight, so go to your drugstore if you possibly can and get a jar of Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of our delightful comedy, So This is Washington, with Lum and Abner in their usual characters, and Jimmy Gleason as Mr. Marshall. Well, it doesn't take long for Lum and Abner to show Mr. Marshall what they've got. Marshall is pretty excited over uncovering something as important as a new synthetic rubber, and he sees this as an opportunity to vindicate himself in the eyes of the press. Consequently, he has assembled a group of news reporters, along with government and war officials, to witness Abner's demonstration. Well, I believe they're about ready for you, Abner. You sure you can recollect how to cook up that rubber now? Why, sure, sure. Now, just take some sweet gum. Hey, Chuck, now, don't tell that formula to nobody, not even me. Recollect, this is war. 
Oh, excuse me. And for pity's sakes, don't start eating another banana now, right in front of all these important people. I can't help it. I'm hungry in front or in back of them. Well, put it down. <laughs> you don't want these folks to think you're backwoodsy. Oh, don't lay it there. Well, you said Never it. mind, never mind. Mr. Marshall signaling it for you. All right, Mr. Peabody, right over here, please. Get up, Abner, and try to act dignified. Yeah, yeah. Well, here I go. Yeah, watch out where you're stepping. Uh-oh. My goodness, are you hurt, Mr. Peabody? Dad, blame it, I told him not to put that banana on the floor. Abner, you idiot, get up. Abner? Abner? Hey, Granny, he's unconscious. Miss Jones, Miss Jones, call a doctor, quick. Doctor, is he, is he going to be all right? Yes, I think so. He struck his head a good blow, but there's no sign of fracture. Oh. Probably not even a serious concussion. Oh. Wait, I think he's coming too now. Uh, can you hear me? I don't want to put it on the window there. Can you hear me, sir? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, sure, I can hear you. How, how do you feel, Abner? Oh, i fine, fine. That's good. Well, I reckon we can get ahead with it. Get ahead with what? Oh, you know, sir. The rubber demonstration. We're waiting to see the synthetic rubber mixed. Mixing synthetics robber. Well, of course. Hey, doggy, that sounds right interesting. I'd like to see that myself. Now, uh, listen here, Abner. Say, who a... is this backwoodsy old varmint here anyway? Who is he? Why, that's Lum, Abner. Lum Abner? <laughs> doggy, sit your name. If I had a name now, like Now, now, listen. <laughs> Will you stop acting smart? We're waiting for the rubber demonstrate. Well, so am I. If you'll just shut up, maybe we can see it. All right, come on, let's get started. I ain't gonna wait all day for this, you know. Abner, what in the world's the matter with you? I, I think I know. Amnesia. Amnesia. Amnesia? Gentlemen, I'll have to check him very carefully. I think you'd better wait outside. <laughs> fine thing. To have synthetic rubber in the palm of my hand and not know how it's made. I know Dabner was going to get in trouble with them bananas sooner or later. You're the one I'm blaming. Not letting him tell you his formula. Sheer stupidity. Well, I, I figured it was a military secret. Poor Abner. I, I sure wish that doctor would get done with him in there. Well, here they come now. Hey, I told you, Doc. I told you I was in perfect condition. Yes, sir, you can put me right in 1A right now. And I won't consider joining nothing except the Marines, neither. Abner. Or if they're filled up, I would join a paratrooper, I reckon. Abner. What's this feller calling me Abner for? That ain't my name. What is your name, sir? Why, it's, uh, it's, uh, Buster V. Davenport. Buster V. Davenport? Yeah, that's me, kid, right here. For the land's sakes, where did you ever get Got my name? initials right here on my underpants. Look, read them yourself. Right there. BVD. <laughs> Come on now, let's get ahead to signing me up here. Oh, you can't make it too quick for me. I want to get in here. I come all the way from Paris, France, just to do my bit, boy. Paris, France? Where'd you ever get that idea? Who is this fella that keeps picking on me? I said Paris. Got it wrote down right on my garter. Doctor seen it, didn't you, Doc? Uh, uh yes, 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 I did. Uh, look, I have to confer with my, uh, colleagues here. Would you mind waiting in the other office? No, no, no. Talk to your colleagues all you want to. I might write a postcard to my relay back in France while I'm gone. <laughs> Doc, is there anything we can do? Well, there's a drastic measure that's been known to work. He lost his memory from a blow on the head. Another blow in the same locality. Oh, uh, I, I, I don't like that. Could kill him. And that's sort of serious. Yes, yes, it is. Look, man, I don't care how, but you've got to bring his memory back. This rubber formula is vital to the nation. Well, familiar sights and faces might do the trick. I suggest you take him back to his hometown. How about it, Abner? You're back home again. These are all your old Pine Ridge friends. Don't you recognize any of them? That's a homeless-looking bunch of yard dogs I ever seen. <laughs> Say, what are we looking for anyway? A Japanese spy? Well, not exactly. They don't look like no Japanese spies to me. None of them. Our dog is wait a minute. Just a minute. There's your spy. There's a face I wouldn't trust nowhere. <laughs> well, Abner, you idiot. You're looking in the mirror. <laughs> Nice-looking feller. 
Doc, can I talk to you and Mr. Marshall a minute? Why, of course. We can step into the back room here. Look here, Doctor. What'll we do? Well, the other methods haven't worked, Mr. Marshall. I'm afraid we must resort to that last desperate chance. No, 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 sir, no, sir. Abner ain't gonna be whopped on the head, I'll tell you that. I'd rather they stay the way he is and have that happen to him. But I tell you, it's your patriotic duty. You mean I'd be patriotic? Don't you understand? It's a national crisis. The country's crying for rubber. Well, when you put it that way, Mr. Marshall, I've got an old croquet mallet back here. Lum, you mean you will? Well, I'm the best friend he's got in the world. If anybody's going to whop him, I'm the one to do it. Now, look here, man. I ain't got no time to argue. All I want to do is get inducted here. What do you fellas want to see me about, anyway? Why, no, we just want you to sit at this table and look at this seed catalog. That's all. That's all. Oh, oh say, you, you dropped your croquet mallet there. Here, I'll get it for you. Uh, here. Oh, well, much obliged. Oh, not at all. Now, what I'm going to do, Abner, is, uh, well, ask you some questions. Sort of a intelligence test, so you can be inducted. Oh, well, good. Good for me. Yeah. What are you standing back of me for? Well, uh, see, I know the answers, you see, and if I stand out in front there, I might give you a hint accidental, and that'd be cheating. Oh, yeah, well, I don't want to cheat. No, sir. No, sir. Hell, let's get started. Yes, yes, yes. Let's get started. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Give me a good hard one. <laughs> Well, go on, let me have it. Abner, this is hurting me worse than it's going to hurt you. All right, doggies, will you quit calling me Abner? Who is this Abner feller, anyway? Best friend I ever had. The finer feller never drawed breath. Reckon he didn't have no faults at all, huh? Well, some, I reckon. There was a time he might and I married me to the widow Abernathy. He knowed I despised her. Never liked her neither, as far as that goes. <laughs> That's just about the kind of a trick I figured he'd pull, a varmint. Well, I don't think he really done it on purpose. Abner ain't the ah, kind of I bound you he did, too. I know the type, that snake in the weed. Now, wait a minute. You got him wrong. How he many never... young'uns has a widow got for you to support? Listen, I ain't married to her. I never oh, was married. Oh, separated, huh? How much alimony is this Abner making you pay to her? I ain't paying no alimony to her. Oh, Abner's taking it all. He even cheats poor old widow women. They ought to tar and feather him. He ain't taking no... He's a fine, he's good a man. He's a low-down, underhand... Now, fellas, so let's not talk. Keep out of this, Marshal. You little varmint, you say another word again, Abner, and I'll... I'll knock you right on the head with this... Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Marshall. I never meant to hit you. I was aiming to whop this little critter right here. Oh, oh Abner, I'm sorry. I, I didn't really mean to. It, it slipped. Abner, say something. Hey, what are we doing back home here, Long? Abner, you call me Long. Why, natural, that's what I've always called you. You've got your memory back. Can you recollect the formula now for your synthetics rubber? Why, of course I can. I ain't never forgot it. Aye, grannies, we're saved. The country saved. You hear that, Mr. Marshall? Mr. Marshall. <laughs> you look sort of cute. Are, are you all right, Mr. Marshall? Marshall. Uh, <laughs> why, yes. Ain't that your name? No, sir. I'm Buster V. Davenport of Paris, France. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lum and Abner and Jimmy Gleason, for a most amusing half hour. Now, Mr. Bradley, don't carry on about that. Me and Abner's glad to be here. Why? And Mr. Gleason, too. Why, sure. Everybody knows about the wonderful work being done by the Motion Picture Relief Fund at its country house. This radio program helps to carry on that work, and we think it's an honor to participate. And may I add that goes for Jimmy Gleason, too? Thank you all again. Now, before we tell you about next week's Lady Esther Screen Guild program... Here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Seeing is believing. That's why I want you to see with your own eyes exactly what happens when you apply Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. I want you to take half a minute to prove how much fresher and lovelier your skin will look than it's ever looked before. You can make my simple test in the time you count 30. Just rub Lady Esther Face Cream on one cheek, then wipe it off, and run your fingers over that cheek. Feel the difference. 
Feel how smooth and silky it is to your touch. Now powder that cheek and see the difference. See how the dull, drab look is gone. How your skin has taken on new life, new beauty. You see, Lady Esther Face Cream does all these four things. One, it thoroughly cleans your skin. Two, it softens your skin. Three, it helps nature refine the pores. And four, it leaves a smooth, perfect base for powder. Remember, you can prove all this in just 30 seconds, half a minute, with the patch test. So get a jar of Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream and make the patch test at your very first opportunity. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Next Time We Love. It will star Robert Cummings and Joan Fontaine. Be sure to listen. Lum and Abner can be heard on their own radio program for Alka-Seltzer Monday through Thursdays over another network. Jimmy Gleason is currently making the Paramount picture The Well-Groomed Bride. So This Is Washington is a Jack William Boshin production released through RKO Radio Pictures. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Thank you. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. A fun half hour if you appreciate the sort of uh, typical Lum and Abner humor, which I do. I've listened to every episode of their uh, radiography. I watched the movie beforehand, and it appears that this went through a bit of a rewrite. It played more into the sort of humor that they used on the radio program, and has that real sort of Lum and Abner feel to it. Now, it should be said that Locke and Goff were the primary creative forces behind Lum and Abner. In fact, for the better part of the show's run, in most episodes, they were the only two actors. In the radio version, you would have uh, several characters who would appear. Squire Skimp, Cedric Weehunt, Grandpappy Spears, and Mousy. I forget his last name at the moment. But all of these characters were played by Locke and Goff. And they were both Arkansas natives, and when they were doing the audition that would eventually become Lum and Abner, they were originally planning on doing some sort of blackface performance, but they changed to doing something much more like Lum and Abner, which really uh, made a difference and created a couple of very iconic characters. Now, Lum and Abner are generally referred to as older gentlemen. You kind of imagine them in their late 50s or early 60s. However, Locke and Goff were far younger. Locke was 41 when this was released in theaters, and Goff was 37 years old. It was funny, I saw someone in the comments on the YouTube video that they looked far older than they were. That's not how they naturally looked. They used makeup for the movies, and I think it was a pretty good makeup. You don't get the sense of them looking like they're wearing a disguise. And they play the older characters pretty well. And there's an ease about it because they knew people like this. Now, there were a few things that were left out because of time that were kind of fun in the film. They did have an opening scene in the Jot 'em Down store where they were waiting on customers. And they kind of played with the idea that because Pine Ridge is a small town, that Lum and Abner had to kind of do all of the different volunteer war work that might be relevant. They had this really amusing thing where... Uh, one of them would say, yo, you've got to go to this office, and they would just hit, like, a buzzer, and a sign would drop down saying that, oh, yeah, this is the office that handles disputes over uh, ration points. 
or this is the office that uh, handles uh, gas rationing. I know there was no way to get it on the radio, but if you were a fan of the radio program, it was just a nice little Easter egg to see them working in the store. And there were a couple of funny bits left out. Uh, there was this scene at the railway station where Abner was confused about what a red cap was. And they also had a scene during the whole looking for lodgings sequence where they were offered a not to stay and they actually got into a bed, went to sleep, and woke up late and found that they had been put in a display window. So that was a funny scene, but I think it would have been really hard to get into this half-hour radio version. There was also a romance that was thankfully cut. In the movie, the reporter that was critical of Marshall had a thing for Marshall's secretary. Doubtless listeners miss this uh, romance. Uh, it's one of those things that they did with comedy films, where you had, like, a major comic talent, like Abbott and Costello or Laurel and Hardy, because they were comedians and not known as romantic talents, they went ahead and they figured, what this needs is a random romance. It annoyed Abbott and Costello, and I think understandably so. That's why they did some films independently so they wouldn't have these silly boy-girl plots. Now, that's not to say it couldn't work out, particularly if they could sing really well, like Francis Langford in the first uh, Lum and Abner movie, Dreamin' Out Loud, or Dick Ferran in uh, the Abbott and Costello film, Ride 'em Cowboy weren't quite as good as the comedy, but really added something to the film. But I'm glad they left it out of the radio version because the way that was written, it was just kind of very half hearted. One other thing that does stand out between the movie and radio version is the tone of the scenes in Washington. In the movie version, Lum's uh, praise for the city. And for the monuments, is played pretty straight. Even though to the trained eye, it's apparent that the scenes in Washington are being shot against a screen because there's a war on and you can't just go to Washington and film a scene. Here they poke some good-natured fun both at the culture of Washington and at the Washington Monument. Now, this does not reflect a decline in patriotism, but it does reflect a change in the mood. The film version of So Is This Is Washington was re released in 1943 and probably filmed relatively early in that year. The radio version was released in the spring of 1945 with VE Day and the end of the war clearly in sight. So jokes like these were okay, whereas two years previously, it might have been a bit more iffy. I will also say that it may be slightly immature of me, but I do like the Buster v. Davenport joke. It's the type of joke that can transcend generations, because it's essentially the same joke that was used 40 years later in Back to the Future, when Marty travels back to 1955 and gets hit by a car, and Lorraine thinks that his name is Calvin Klein because that's what's on his underwear. Well, that is actually all for this week. I'm saying about maybe lining up a special guest to be with us next week when we continue the series. So hopefully I'll be back and maybe with a friend next Wednesday. In the meantime, if you do have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.